How do we live forever? It's the question at the heart of the 2012 film Cloud Atlas, directed by the Wachowskis. Or one of the questions of Cloud Atlas, or one of the questions of one of the time periods of Cloud Atlas. Okay, look, there are a lot of themes juggled by the narrative of the film. Greed and the exploitation of one culture by another comes to mind. I mean, there is a reason every time period in the film references cannibalism at least once. But what I want to talk about today, anyway, is the everlasting life of humanity. The manner in which a life or the impact of a life on the universe goes on after death. The desire for immortality that is, perhaps, a byproduct of the fear of death. One's feelings on death are often shaped by one's beliefs on the existence or non-existence of an afterlife or some piece of one's being going on after one's demise. In the film, a man on a boat writes a journal, and many, many years later, another man reads this journal and this interconnectivity continues all the way into the future, in which a cloned slave writes a manifesto and it becomes the religious groundwork of a society in an even more distant future. Robert Frobisher, the composer of the Cloud Atlas song, remarks that nobody stays dead for long. He states this as he prepares to commit suicide. A belief in the afterlife is a fundamental tenet of most world religions. In the ship in 1849, characters are explicitly referred to as Christians to differentiate themselves from others. In one scene with a crucifix behind, a character stamps a contract and says that it is the most binding document between people, but only outside of scripture. The men believe in the existence of the human soul, and based on their commentary on the cultural ladder, they likely also believe in the exceptionalism of the Christian soul, a concept called special salvation. They, no doubt, believe that their immortality has been sealed as much as the contract. They will ascend into heaven upon their deaths, they believe. For others, like the stowaway who the captain of the ship almost murders, the men believe will not receive such a reward. There is more. In the distant future time period, the people believe their souls are weighed down by stones whenever they do wrong, suggestive of the concept of sin. Also, their prayers to Sunmi451 for guidance are similar in tone to the Christian concept of the forgiveness of sins. Cloud Atlas argues against such distance between human beings, and instead argues for the closeness of humanity and the interconnective nature of our lives, as seen in the reoccurring comet birthmark appearing on some of the central characters. If anything, the narrative more explicitly reaffirms reincarnation, immortality as a process that lasts over many generations. Actions in one's life mark actions in the next. Reincarnation is the belief that an aspect of every human being continues after death. The soul, the mind, the consciousness, whatever you want to call it, is reborn into a new living being in an interconnected cycle of life. This transmigration varies depending on the religion and culture, and could be in the form of a newborn human being, animal, plant, or some other non-human creature. Cloud Atlas borrows from various religions to explain its version of reincarnation. In Hinduism, for example, the soul is considered immortal. After death, the soul travels into another realm for a time and then returns to be reborn in a new body. Karma determines the quality of the new body based on the actions of the soul's previous life and spiritual needs. The soul is without gender in Hinduism, so when we see some characters reborn as a different gender, this is in keeping with this religious belief. However, one difference is that in Cloud Atlas, we only see reincarnation from human to human. Characters face similar challenges in one time period as they face in future time periods. The appeal of reincarnation is that, unlike heaven and hell, a human being has many chances to get it right. Under any other view of immortality discussed today, or any other view of life, the idea is, well, you only live once. Under reincarnation, we live many lives. 
Unlike most traditional beliefs in reincarnation, the main characters of Cloud Atlas are born within close proximity to each other in terms of both time and location. This is not in keeping with how reincarnation is generally understood, but it helps keep the narrative cohesive. There is a well-worn trope in film and television. A character, sometimes a villain but often the misguided hero who needs to learn a lesson, is trying to achieve immortality in some way. And then, the wise old sage says some platitude like, True immortality is the friends we made along the way. The real answer to immortality in this scenario is described as our impact on the world, with the most common solution to this being children. Procreation, passing along for genetics, is a form of immortality. A piece of you exists in the gene pool for a long time, or at least as long as your children and further descendants continue to choose to have children. And if you adopted your children, the impact you had on their lives still affects who they become and who their children or other people in their lives become. As an old man, we see that Zachary had many children and that his children also procreated. He has a grandfather, and for many parents and grandparents, this is their legacy. This is their attempt at immortality. Yet some would argue that one's children are not one's legacy because these children exist for their own lives and not as some experiment in the parent's immortality or as a vain reflection of who they once were. In the film, this is explored through characters like Louisa Ray. A man recognizes her last name as that of a famous journalist, her father. The man remarks that he must be very proud of Louisa for following in his footsteps. Why would a similarity in interests make the father proud? Shouldn't this father be proud regardless of Louisa's career choice? Is this what parents want? A miniature version of themselves through which to live vicariously? Is this immortality? Children may have similar character traits or appearance as the parent, but if the parents are doing their jobs appropriately, the children will find their own paths and become their own people. One could argue that their legacy does not extend outside of themselves. If children are the extension of the legacy and immortality of the parents, what about children who never meet their parents? Does a parent who never meets their child still believe them to be their legacy? Cloud Atlas tackles another way in which people are immortal through their impact in the world beyond that of children. Every decision, every written word, everything spoken has an impact on the world in some way, in varying degrees. The writings of someone from centuries ago eventually affect the lives of others, who affect the lives of others still, up until the point that a religion is created in the wasteland of the world. Even without the reincarnation stuff, we see clearly that the real immortality for everyone in the film is what they do, the effects that they have on the world. Immortality is what we do. The body may die, but every other life we touch, every decision we make, will create tiny changes to the earth. It's our legacy. It's not a fulfilling answer, though. Most of what we do, what we change, is unknown to others. We cannot calculate our impact on the world. If someone walks down the street and interacts with someone, setting off a string of other interactions that eventually lead to that person achieving happiness or greatness, nobody will know that the person walking down the street had anything to do with it. Our true legacy will never be known, because nobody can truly know exactly what the world would have been like if we had never been born. Our actions are meaningful, but they are so difficult to measure. The consequences of every interaction. It's like air. Important, but invisible. We cannot mark every consequence as a result of our actions so that others may know us when we are gone. They just won't know. It is the loneliest immortality, even if, perhaps, it is the most true. It's not death we fear, but the idea that maybe our life was not well lived. The hope for immortality, instead, is the hope that our life meant something. Hi everyone, if you like what I do, please click on the orange Patreon link below. That's how this show happens. It's also the only way to request an episode. 
Also, please like, share, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you never miss an episode. I'll see you next week.